When you mention cliff dwellers, most people think of ancient civilizations who carved homes into mountainsides hundreds or thousands of years ago. However, in our travels in northern Arizona with our trusty Nissan Armada, we visited some much more modern dwellings built into the natural protection of the landscape. These remains date back to 1929, when car trouble left Blanche Russell, a former Ziegfeld Follies dancer, and her husband Bill, stranded by the side of the road. They had left New York City in search of a more hospitable climate for Bill's tuberculosis, and after crossing the old Navajo Bridge over the Colorado River, their car sputtered to a stop among these unique rock formations along what is now U.S. Highway 89A. Finding that the weather was agreeable for Bill's illness, and with the lack of cash in this early depression time, the Russells decided to stay a while. They built a lean-to of tar paper and boards against the largest available rock and set up housekeeping. Blanche then began serving meals to visitors in exchange for labor, and by the mid-1930s, when the road was paved, visitors and locals were making a regular stop at what was then called Rock Village. Ranchers driving cattle through the area named the homestead Cliff Dwellers because of its proximity to the Vermilion Cliffs and the name stuck. Before long, the restaurant became a full-service eatery and a trading post and gas station were added. Additional crude lean-to buildings were put up to serve as accommodations for tourists and things were humming along. After Bill's death in the early 1940s, Blanche sold the property and moved on. The new owners added a bar stocked with bootleg liquor, and the spot continued to grow. Subsequent owners then added river tours up and down Glen Canyon to the attractions at Cliff Dwellers. In the early 1950s, the original dwellings were shut down, and a proper lodge was built just to the north. Today, the remains of the original home, as well as a root cellar and outhouse, are still standing. It makes an interesting stop for a bit of history if you're traveling in the area, and more modern food, fuel, and lodging are available. You can also find locally made jewelry and handicrafts for sale at the side of the road. So made on the reservation? Yes, we do make them ourselves and you know, some silver. And how long have you been making jewelry? I've been making jewelry since I was probably 15, 13. Really? You enjoy doing that? Oh yeah. What do you have there? Oh, some beaded earrings and some earrings that we make ourselves with turquoise and different abalone shells that we usually use in our traditional stuff in, in the Navajo tradition and a lot of them are all made by family on the beadwork and my aunt does the beadwork herself and my mom does some of the work too. Well, do you find all the stones in this area? Uh, we do find some of the stones in the area like the turquoise and some of the little agates that we find and then the other ones we usually go to rock shows or different um, gym, gym stores and all that we get them from there. Oh you do? Yes. Some of them we buy them in nuggets and they usually cut them out like that. And there's different artists all over the reservations that we trade with and that we get some of the stuff from and and some we do ourselves. So we mostly buy all the supplies and we put them together ourselves. A beautiful assortment. Did you, did you say you also uh, did bracelets? Uh, yes, we do bracelets and some of them we string out of these with different stones and shells and um, we string them on miniature nylon quarter cable wire which is jewelry wires that we use on all of them. Oh, do you sell these uh, to any of the stores in the area? Yes we do. We use, you know, especially in the winter or sometimes in the summer and a lot of you know 
families do sell them to the stores and then sell them to other wholesalers and that's how they some of the Navajos make a living like that. What kind of prices do you get for your jewelry? Well actually like around $25 to $30 per pair on earrings and some of them are like $6 to $5 a pair. South of Cliff Dwellers, the town of Cameron also offers accommodations, shopping, and Navajo tacos and other food treats, as well as an historic bridge over the Little Colorado River. River trips on the Colorado are still a popular attraction in the region for a more adventurous way of taking in the spectacular scenery. When the Russells crossed the Navajo Bridge in 1929, it was known as the Grand Canyon Bridge. It was also a brand new structure, and at the time, the highest steel arch bridge in the world. The name was officially changed to Navajo Bridge in 1934, and the original bridge served travelers in this remote area until 1995. A new, higher capacity span was built right next to the other and in the same style, so that now the new and old look like twins crossing high above the Colorado River. An interpretive center at the site gives background on the history of the construction of the bridges. Before the bridge was built, the only way across the river in this area was the crossing at Lee's Ferry, a few miles upriver from the present bridge location. With more than 600 miles of steep canyons surrounding the river, John Doyle Lee's Ferry operated at the only wagon accessible point to the river in the vicinity. We'll be right back with more from Arizona as we head up the river to Lee's Ferry. Now let's get back to Lee's Ferry, Arizona. As Mormon settlers moved from Utah to areas in Arizona starting in the 1870s, the ferry business was good, although still quite dangerous. The ferry site, at the confluence of the Perea and Colorado rivers, was also a small Mormon settlement at the time. John D. Lee moved to the area in 1871 as a fugitive from justice for his part in the Mountain Meadows Massacre. In 1879, after the law caught up with Lee and he was tried and executed, his wife sold the ferry operation to the Mormon church. The church ran it until 1913, when it changed hands a couple of times before being taken over by Coconino County a few years later and run as a public entity until the completion of the bridge in 1929. These days, the remains of the settlement at Lee's Ferry are open for tours. Uh, this was built in 1881 by Warren Johnson for his wife Samantha. He had two children while she was here. His second wife, Amelia, was next door in the cabin. She had two children. They spent 18 years here on a mission for the Mormon Church running the ferry because the church built the road and operated the ferry for 30 years and they ended up with 20 children here. And in 1885, they took down the cabin next door and built a two-story frame house. And that burned down in 1926, so we don't have that anymore. But this building was lived in until the 1960s, so we're fortunate to have as much of the original still here. When it was built, it had a flat roof with logs and dirt on top, and a dirt floor with carpeting. Uh, in the 1890s, it was remodeled as a school building. They put the peak roof and the loft and the roof floor and had benches for the kids. And there were 12 to 18 children who fought in here through the 1890s. It was 
one of the oldest schoolhouses still standing in Arizona. Uh, families lived here through the 1930s. They talked to several people who were raised in this building. I remember sleeping in the loft as little kids and how scary it was. <laughs> uh, and then in 1935, the property was sold to a couple of supply staff, and they built the big stone house there as a guest ranch. And this was one of the guest cottages. They put the blue trim on the windows, but the windows were here and the doors basically as you see them. Farm was really the key to the success of the ferry because the only reason it was here was so the people could be self-sufficient. They had to remove all their own food being so isolated out here. So they ended up with over 40 acres under cultivation, three farms up the camp. And it was very successful, but incredibly hard work and very hot temperature. Our Nissan Armada was a terrific travel partner throughout this remote scenic area. With plenty of space and comfort inside for relaxing while covering the long distances, and plenty of power for flattening the hills, the Armada felt right at home. Having its strong off-pavement capabilities at the ready also gave us plenty of security in exploring the more desolate trails. This northern Arizona area is a gateway to the north rim of the Grand Canyon and to the parks of southern Utah, and you'll find plenty of history to take in along with the spectacular sights.